Who will be Israel's next prime minister? There's no clear winner in its second election in a year. And with lengthy coalition talks about to start, how will the political bargaining turn out? What kind of government will Israel get this time? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Benjamin Netanyahu is seeking a record fifth term in office as Israel's prime minister, but his grip on power appears to be slipping. Preliminary election results show Netanyahu's Likud party almost tied with the blue and white party led by Benny Gantz. Both are short of the parliamentary majority they need to form a coalition government. This means whoever gets support from smaller parties will become the next prime minister. And in that case, the kingmaker could be Israel Betanu's leader, Avigdor Lieberman. Israel's president, Reuven Rivlin, will then decide who will get the job. If Benjamin Netanyahu loses it, he's at risk of being jailed for alleged corruption. Harry Fawcett has been following the elections from Tel Aviv. The music blurred, Benjamin Netanyahu smiled, but more than five hours after voting finished, it was clear this was no victory, even if he was far from ready to admit defeat. A government committed to the Jewish state. There neither will nor can there be a government that relies on anti-Zionist Arab parties. But the exit poll suggests he doesn't have the numbers to dictate. He may not be given first chance to form a government. Five months ago, Benjamin Netanyahu waited several hours before making his speech, waiting for the numbers to swing in his favor. This time, he's waited longer, but the numbers appear to have swung in the other direction. Five months ago, he made a victory speech. This time, it was a speech of defiance. It seems clear that his grip on power has weakened in the intervening time. At the opposition blue and white headquarters, the mood was very different. Former Army Chief Benny Gantz didn't repeat his premature victory declaration from April. Instead, his tone was of a man ready for a grave responsibility. We need to be patient. It wasn't an easy mission. As we see now, Netanyahu did not succeed in his mission. We, in comparison, proved that the idea of blue and white succeeded big time and is here to stay. There was equal vindication for Avigdor Lieberman, Netanyahu's former ally who collapsed the coalition talks, pushed his secular agenda and nearly doubled his Israel Betenu party's vote. We have only one option, a national liberal government made up of Israel Betenu, Likud and blue and white. The presumption is that he'd demand Likud first replace Netanyahu as leader, but that's something it shows no sign of readiness to do. Netanyahu is the leader of the Likud. Support for him is strong, and in times of crisis, it gets stronger. It all came after a frenetic final day of campaigning. Gantz aping Netanyahu's tactics, urging supporters off the beach, telling them his party was on the verge of defeat. Netanyahu seemed to spend the day in one long emergency broadcast on social media and in person, repeatedly warning his right-wing base that Arabs were voting in great numbers. The leader of the mainly Palestinian-Israeli joint list, Ayman Ode, said Netanyahu's incitement had come at a heavy price, causing instead a surge in support. It's possible we did see some form of backlash. People saying, you say we're going to um, come to the, the polls in, uh, in robes, so we are. Here we come, and, uh, and this is what we can do in Israeli politics. Ode's office says he's due to have talks soon with Benny Gantz, raising the possibility that he could offer him some kind of support. Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on stage of the difficulties and pressure of this campaign, with his first pre-indictment hearing on corruption charges due in two weeks, and the prospects of fighting them from the Prime Minister's office now diminished, the pressure looks set to intensify. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, Tel Aviv. All right, let's bring in our guests. Akiva Eldar is a columnist for Al Monitor's Israel Pulse, and he joins us by Skype from Tel Aviv. Yossi Meckelberg is professor of international relations at Regents University and a specialist in Israeli politics. He joins us from London. And Mitchell Barak is CEO of Kivun Global Research and a former advisor to Israeli President Shimon Peres. He joins us from West Jerusalem. Welcome all our guests. Now, Mitchell, let me start with you. This gamble by Benjamin Netanyahu to dissolve parliament, this really didn't pay off, did it? 
you know, he pushed himself a little too far. And the way it goes is you can only cry wolf so many times when there's no real wolf. And I think that's what he came up against. He's a somewhat of a failure in that he should have, going into this election, he was at about 45 seats. If you add his 35, Cajlon's uh, four seats, and Fagelin's two seats, uh, and he didn't even get close to that. There was a negative momentum against him, and it seems like uh, Israelis want to change, and he will have difficulty in any scenario forming a government as it is right now. You'll see this election result seems to bring even less clarity than the last one. What happens now? Well, you're right, but most elections don't really bring uh, clarity. There is a fog of elections in Israel. You look at the figures and it's sometimes the fog is even thicker. You try to reach to the calculator and see what kind of coalition can be formed. But I think the minute, if it happens, that it's obvious that Netanyahu can form a coalition and the only condition for a coalition is for Netanyahu to go, maybe this will create some clarity and it will empower some other leaders within their party, within the Likud, actually to think more creatively uh, and, and think about coalitions that right now seems not very, that, that likely, but might be likely when not only Netanyahu, the person, but what he, the way that he poisoned the Israeli politics. Akiva, Benjamin Netanyahu has this storied reputation as a political magician. But obviously, the magic didn't work this time. How humiliating is this result for him? I still think that uh, Netanyahu is a magician. Um, but uh, unfortunately for him, um, there is uh, another Israeli magician that uh, is able maybe to even manipulate the uh, great magician. His name is Avigdor Lieberman. If you take uh, the eight seats that Lieberman um, has received in these elections, and you add them to the alliance of uh, the, the Israeli uh, right, plus the ultra-Orthodox and the national Orthodox, you get a clear majority. Netanyahu would still be able to form a government. In addition to that, unfortunately also for us Israelis, um, the Israeli Arabs are not natural partners for any government in Israel. Of course, not for a right-wing national government headed by Netanyahu, and neither by Gantz, who uh, is not very likely to add the uh, Arab party, the 12 new members of Knesset, new and old members of Knesset from the uh, United Arab Party to his coalition. So um, Netanyahu, having said what uh, Yossi just said, that Netanyahu made some mistakes and uh, he cried too many times wolf, I believe that. And actually he cried, uh, one time he cried wolf and, open, and was about to open a war, which was uh, too transparent even for his uh, supporters that it was uh, a way out of trouble for him. Mm -hmm. I think that Gantz will have to work very hard in order to uh, make sure that uh, he can keep together mm -hmm. a coalition mm -hmm. without depending on Lieberman. Mitchell, I saw you nodding along to what Akiva was saying, so I'm going to let you respond or expand on what he was saying. But I also want to ask you, is Avigdor Lieberman the kingmaker now? Uh, he's one of them. I mean, certainly, you know, I like uh, Akiva's description that he's also a magician. But, you know, I think as we said in the last program, sometimes the uh, Houdini has just one too many locks and he can't get out of it. And I think that, uh, that uh, Netanyahu purchased the rope that is going to hang himself politically by calling elections the last time. And that's what we're seeing now. So, yes, Lieberman is a really important. I like to call him he's the king breaker and then the king maker meaning he is the only one that can really break Netanyahu's kingship or Netanyahu's leadership. And he's basically already done that by saying he will only go with someone who wants to form a national unity government. It's clear among the two candidates that Gantz has come out and said, I would like to form a national unity in the widest possible government. And Netanyahu who's scraping, trying to scrape together, you know, a very narrow and minimal government. So that's one thing. He can break Netanyahu, actually. 
and then he can decide and be the kingmaker. Now, that could be very interesting, too, meaning it does look like it's Benny Gantz at this point, uh, because he seems to be the head of the largest party. He will probably get the mandate, if so, if he has enough from the president. But it doesn't mean there won't be a deadlock. And it doesn't mean that everyone in the Likud will be willing to go with him. And it could be that there's another candidate lurking there somewhere within the 120 members of Knesset that can step through as a caretaker prime minister, as a agreed-upon prime minister. So really, there's a lot of things that will take place. He's not only, it's not only Lieberman, it's also about Ruby Rivlin, the president, who by law has to consult all the parties, but he doesn't have to do anything, and actually. He can go to whichever member of Knesset or head of party that he thinks is most likely to form a government, and there could be some surprises there as well. EOC, let me ask you about Lieberman. I mean, using Mitchell's terms here, do you think he will be the king breaker or do you think he will be the king maker? And also, you know, Lieberman, he's insisted that he will keep this campaign promise that he made, that his, uh, his party will not join a right-wing government or an alliance that included ultra-Orthodox parties. Do you believe that will remain the case? Well, I think th this is the real test. If everyone sticks to the script as they put before the elections, I think it's a bit clearer, but this hasn't happened in Israel uh, politics too often. And talking about magicians, they might be magicians, but they don't have any, any magic or any tricks. Because at the end of the day, we concentrate so much on the arithmetic of all of it, but we forget that at the end of the day, you need a functioning government. And if you just get broad coalition and you put as many parties as you like and it seems stable, but this won't hold because there will be all sort of full push forces there in in direction that are unsustainable i think yes he can you know break the king and i think one of the thing with netanyahu is just not it's not only netanyahu the man it's the psychology of the mentality in the last uh, decade in which only netanyahu can be a prime minister he tried to convey the message he's the only statesman he's the only one that look after security he's the only one that guaranteed the startup nation from keep developing, which is, which is a myth. It's, it's, it's far from the truth. And I think it, it's, it's for the political system to rid itself of the belief that it can be only Netanyahu, and then you can start making ad, other kings mm -hmm. and, and start working on the post-Netanyahu era. Akiva, what about President Rivlin? I mean, we, we've mentioned him already in this program. Obviously, he's going to be giving a mandate to whichever candidate he believes will be able to form the government. But is there any indication on what he will do at this point? I think that what uh, he has been already doing is uh, trying to get uh, one of the uh, leaders of the Likud, the top uh, of the uh, Likud faction, to come up with an idea how the Likud and uh, Blue and White can join together and uh, are trying to get a solution to Netanyahu's problem. Netanyahu became actually now a nuisance for the Likud personally. So, for instance, uh, what he can offer is that Netanyahu will uh, take some time out from politics to deal with his own problems, with the corruption cases that are following him. And if he is cleared, if uh, um, after the, he's indicted, he will, of course, have to stand trial. But if he's acquitted, he can go back. And they can even sign a coalition agreement that will allow Gantz to uh, be the prime minister for a year or two, and uh, Netanyahu will have a vacancy there uh, if he's acquitted. This is one possibility. What I don't believe that Rivlin will allow is uh, to lead Israel, to allow Israel to uh, another chaotic situation of uh, three elections in a row in less than one year. I don't think that this will happen. He will try, he will do his best to get Gantz and the Likud without Netanyahu, and as I said, to find a way out for Netanyahu, because it's about, the elections were about Netanyahu's immunity. This is why we mm -hmm. went uh, for early elections in April, and this is why we went back now. If not, for Netanyahu, if it was someone else from the Likud, mm -hmm. we could have a unity government, Likud and Gantz, after the April election. Mitchell, I mean, Akiva just mentioned those 
looming indictments against Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, Likud has pledged to stand by him, but clearly there must be members of the party that are seeing him as a liability right now. I mean, how much longer do they go all in on Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, let me let you in on a secret. All of them see him as a liability, every single one of them, and they know it. And the reason that they're coming out in support of him now is because they're thinking of ahead. Any of those people that are going to be heir apparent, that are going to eventually uh, go for head of the Likud, or even members of Knesset, the next time the slate is voted, do not want to be punished by the Likud membership. And they will punish someone for betraying a prime minister, especially the leader of the party who's in crisis. You have to remember something about the Likud. Since 1977, until today, there have been only five leaders of the Likud. Begin, Shamir, Netanyahu, Sharon, that's four, and back to Netanyahu again. They don't change leaders. They give them a chance. They let them fail. They're certainly not going to kick them when they're down. So right now, that they're, that's what they're doing. They're saying they're going to stand by him. But basically, Netanyahu has been captaining a Titanic. The Likud is a Titanic, and it hit the first iceberg when he called early elections for immunity. And it hit the second big iceberg when he couldn't put together a government after what was clearly some kind of victory where he could go to a right of center uh, government or to a national unity government with Gantz and get 70 seats. He didn't do it. They went with him for this next election. This is really the last chance. No one is going to stick with him, or it's very unlikely. Either some people are going to start to peel off or they're going to start their own faction. Uh, they need a third of the faction to break off. But it's much more likely that Netanyahu will get it. He can't form a government, and he will not have support in his party. There's no way they're going to let him take him down also. Yossi, how big of an achievement is the result for Benny Gantz and for Blue and White? And, and also, how likely is it that Benny Gantz could become the next prime minister of Israel? I think it's an achievement that they actually maintain this is not a party. The Blue and White is, is, is not a real party. It's, it's an alliance of people with very different opinions. It doesn't have a coherent platform, ideology, set of ideas and values. I think what keeps them together is we are not Netanyahu. We want something, something else. And I think this goes also back to what uh, Mitchell said earlier. I, I, I agree with him about loyalty, but I think there is a point in which you start distance yourself just a little bit to create some gap between you and someone that in, in very short time might be indicted for three serious corruption allegations. And in politics, we know loyalty can go that far. Beyond that, the politician starts thinking about their own future and whether they are going to be uh, elected and whether they are going to, uh, to stay, to, to be part of a government. I think, again, Benny Gantz is, is, is an unknown quantity and quality. And, and, and in, the, in, in this sense, can he be a good prime minister? I think you know it only when you're, you're a prime minister, how good, then we can start to assess. Some of the quality that he has as a former chief of staff is, is at least unlike Netanyahu, is in, regarded as an honest person. Can at the time of crisis, can he, can he, can he rise above it and, and show leadership? Time will tell. What worries me is that the major rival to the Likud party couldn't come with a real alternative. They tried to battle with the Likud party in the, on their own pitch without showing something which diametrically opposite, something that is radically different at the time that Israel needs something different, whether it's on Gaza, on Iran, about disparity within, within, within the Israeli society, and there was too much more of the same, but we are more honest and maybe more capable. Akiva, um, a lot of analysts seem to have been surprised by a higher turnout for Palestinian-Israeli voters. Um, now, you know, this joint list is the third largest bloc, and, of course, uh, Ayman Ode has said that he's interested in being the leader of the opposition, uh, and in, uh, potentially uh, that would include attending security briefings. Do you think a scenario exists where we could see him working now with Benny Gantz? Could this happen? Well, what you can see is what Itzhak Rabin did. Um, and uh, I believe that this is what Benny Gantz has in mind, is to get, first of all, the Arabs not to vote against him, which means to support him from, so to speak, from outside, to be inside the coalition, but not inside the government. 
So um, he has the majority with the Arabs and with Lieberman, but it's, I believe, too much for Lieberman also to digest the Arabs as part of the coalition. You see, even the Israeli Zionist left parties, like the Labour and the Meretz, were not able to form uh, an Israeli Zionist Arab party. There is no such an alliance, and I don't see it in the cards of any party, uh, Jewish party. So um, what uh, happened is that they, they should send a bunch of flowers to Netanyahu, um, Ayman Ode and his colleagues, because the, the uh, incitement against them made them go out of the ballots and vote against Netanyahu. It was not just voting for Ayman Ode and the Unit, United Arab Party, but uh, to send a message to Netanyahu that uh, we, we can punish you. You cannot only threaten us, we can do it also. So um, the next challenge for Gantz will be to find the formula that uh, in the long run will not hurt him, because Netanyahu in the last 10 years delegitimized any cooperation with the Arabs, any photo op with an Arab leader. And this is something that Gantz will have to make to work very hard in order mm -hmm. to diffuse this and to educate the Israeli people that the, the Arabs mm -hmm. are partners for a coalition and can be members of, of the Israeli government. Mitchell, it looked like you wanted to jump in, but I just want to warn you, we only have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to let you do that, but I also want to ask you, are we looking at the potential for weeks of uncertainty and potential instability now? For sure. We're looking at weeks, uh, but uh, every, it's in everyone's best interest to try and wrap this up. Uh, what I do want to say about the Israeli Arab community is we did, actually did a poll for the uh, Conrad Adenauer Foundation um, and Tel Aviv University. We found that uh, the participation would be much higher. And in fact, when we asked, would you support an Arab party joining the government, 50 percent of the population said yes of Israeli Arabs, and another 30 percent said not to join, but to support from the outside. So that's really significant. And I think the irony is here that Netanyahu's greatest legacy to democracy in Israel might be that he started this kind of mini Arab spring here, Israeli Arab spring, in that they, you know, what started four years ago when he said they're coming in, in mass and droves to vote, and last year with the nation state law, and then continually to delegitimize an entire community of citizens, they're fighting back now. And they're saying, we're not going to take this. And we may be part of this country. And we may be part of this system. And the first thing to do is go out and vote. The fact that Benny Gantz spoke to Ayman Ode last night is monumental. I don't think it's happened before that one of the leaders of the party spoke to a, uh, you know, Israeli Arab party leader. And the fact that Ayman Ode, and as you mentioned, is talking about being head of the opposition. That means he gets an official, it's an official position of the state of Israel. He gets an armored car. He gets a, 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 a bodyguard. And he gets to uh, meet any kind of foreign dignitary that comes into the country. So when Trump comes to visit, when uh, Putin comes to visit, he's standing there in the receiving line. And he's going to also get a briefing, mm -hmm. a security that, uh, briefing. Mm -hmm. That's a big step forward for the Israeli Arab community. And we may see that. All right. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to all our guests, Akiva Eldar, Yossi Mecklenburg, and Mitchell Barak. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.